we're now going to talk about your podcast, which is related to people's living standards, of course, because it's about the housing crisis, uh, which defines so much of the lived experience, frankly, of a lot of people, particularly under the age of 40, 45, um, a generation driven into an unregulated rip-off private rented sector where they hand over massive amounts of their often low wages to private landlords to pay off their mortgages and generally to make money. It's called Crash Course with Michael Walker. Let's have a little clip here of Michael Walker debating that, what's his title? Private Landlords Association guy. Private, it was the, the letting, Residential Letting Agents Association. He was a president-elect, and then he's also a lettings director and a state agent, and he's also a landlord of free properties. He Can I just say, for those who are not listening on the podcast, he looks like you expect him to look. Sorry, that's a really personal thing to say, but I'm just saying. Now, personally, when landlords talk about profits and losses, they say, oh, I'm only, you know, it, the rent is only a few hundred pounds more than my mortgage repayments. I'm not I, I'm not rinsing this property for money. I'm not exploiting these tenants because I'm not making a massive profit. Well, you might not be making a massive month to month profit. But at the end of this whole process, you've got someone else to pay for your mortgage. And at the end of the at the end of this whole, you know, rigmarole um, where someone has been paying 50 percent of their earnings to you every month, you have a very valuable asset. You're sitting on a big asset. So I don't really see why landlords expect to both make a month to month profit and acquire a very valuable asset at the end of it. It seems like they want their cake and and to eat it. You'll say, I want someone else to pay my mortgage and I want them to pay above and beyond that as well. Now, to me, that doesn't seem particularly fair. That's not a, a fair relationship. And that's why I'm you know, very frustrated as a, as a renter because I feel like I, I'm giving so much of my earnings to someone to buy them a flat. So firstly, why is it that you are not a property owner? Why is and I'm, I'm, I'm saying you, I mean, why is this hypothetical tenant not a property owner? Why don't they buy their own property uh, and pay off their own mortgage? So that, that's that's point one. Point two, I agree that when there are profits, we can have this conversation. But when there is an £850 a month loss that the landlord has to subsidise somebody's rent by every single month in a market where house values have fallen, uh, and the prediction is that they could fall further. Now, why would a landlord stay in this market? Why would they not just sell and maybe return to the market when conditions become more favourable? Yeah, Michael, why doesn't the tenant just buy a house? No, I did. I, immediately after that interview, actually, I decided it was silly that I was paying rent to someone to buy their, uh, a flat. So I uh, got a mortgage, bought a house, <laughs> and I've been happily paying my mortgage ever since. <laughs> So just go and buy a house. Thank thank you, buy a house. For that advice. Just oh oh, I didn't realize I could just oh you mm. just buy a house. Yeah, yeah. There's, there was a spare two hundred grand um, in my bank account, which, by the way, is the average deposit now for a house in London. I think or one hundred fifty to two hundred grand is in, I mean, in that ballpark. It's is interesting it? because obviously what's happened is the gap between the average earning and the average house price has massively gone up the gap between the two, obviously. Um, but I mean, even when people talk about like, well, you know, you know, you'll inherit this or that from your parent. It's interesting. The average inheritance age for those who are, do have any inheritance, which is obviously a small number. Rel well, it's a, it's a relatively privileged section of younger people, but apparently even that is the average age is 55. <laughs> and it's like something like 10 grand, not a deposit. So it's really interesting because this is so structural and embedded, isn't it? That actually, you know, it's not like all of a sudden there'll be this massive surge in the right in, in home ownership rates as millennials get older. Yeah, well, well unless something significant changes, no. And I, I mean, I think what the what the Conservatives want to do, um, and I think on this count, unfortunately, Labour have sort of lent into it, is they want to restore consent for the system as a whole by allowing a top slice of millennials essentially to join the the property market and get on the housing ladder and enjoy the sort of speculative gains that the housing market has given well it's not a select few because it is you know it's it's a majority of the population have been get, benefiting from the speculative gains of the housing market but the 40 percent who've been locked out haven't been and instead of saying okay well this is a crazy system whereby we have property owners who get to get non-property owners to pay their mortgages instead of saying this is a crazy system let's move away from it they're saying let's maintain support for this system by slicing off a top section of millennials and getting them to, to benefit from it as well. And they'd quite happily see 30% you know, of the population remain 
in this kind of debt penury where you're just paying half of your income, as I said to the landlord there, to buy someone else a flat. Like, it, I can't really imagine a more immoral exploitative relationship whereby you just systematically have poor people work for half of their hours for a rich person to buy them property. It's, it's very, I, I, it was sort of like when I started making the podcast, I mean, it's, it's become more about policy than sort of like the ethics of it. So it's sort of what, what are the solutions? What are the systems whereby you, you don't have this? Because I think railing against landlords is only going to get you so far. It's not going to solve the housing crisis. But I do think it is an interesting framing that it, it's almost like feudalism. You know, you work half of your hours for your own consumption and for your own welfare. And you work half of your hours for the Lord. You work half your hours for the right to maintain your little square of that land, which is what we're, what we're all desperately clinging on to. Um, one of the I'm going to put, by the way, I did, I did, I'm going to put something. An angry landlord got in touch with me when I shared that video with a, a challenge to you, Michael, which I'm going to give mm. to you. But I mean, one of the other issues as well isn't is the legacy of right to buy, because what right to buy did in the 1980s was give a bung to a certain to a to a, large, to a significant chunk of people. Um, but then what happened is 40% of the property sold off of over the right to buy are now let out by buy to let landlords and they're charging on average twice the social rent. Yo, I mean, that's, I mean, I live in an ex council flat, so I'm a living example of that. So, uh, you know, it, it, this is the same property that would have been rented out for half the amount and that money would have gone to the, the local authority, you know, so it, it would have gone to maintaining the house instead. Now um, it's, twice that much, which goes to some property owner somewhere. And I mean, it's not going to, you know, property owners in general are going to be disproportionately wealthy compared to the rest of society. So it's not really going to feed back into our local economy in the same way that it, it would if you increased, well, let's say my income, for example, as an example, completely plucked out of the air. Um, I'd be more likely to spend that money out in the community. If it's going to a landlord, that is just going to sit in a bank account somewhere. And I mean, in, in my house, we're all I don't think any of us are entitled to housing benefit, but in many of these ex-council flats, you've got essentially the government then stumping up the housing benefit. So instead of having a house which is owned by the local authority or the government and the rent is going to them every month, you have the rent doubled and now the state stepping in to pay double the rent to the landlord. So it's, it's completely, uh, it's, it's such a stupid way to run an economy, let's say, is to say what we're going to do is we're going to sell off all of our assets and then we're going to, pay people to live in those assets but the money's going to go straight to a private landlord it, it, it's silly well i've got a challenge to you from a very very angry landlord michael i'd like to know where michael thinks the private tenants will live if there were no private landlords to rent homes from and i can assure you that as a property manager of 20 years i've seen my fair share of tenants that earn more than my landlords they're not all poor so I think well, the, sec the second point is ridiculous. The second point is ridiculous. I mean, it's, it goes without saying that property owners are going to be richer than non-property owners. I mean, because as Greg said, I mean, if, if you can afford to live to buy a house, you probably should. You know, I mean, potentially not right now with interest rates as high as they are, but for the past 40 years, it's been an absolute one-way bet. If you can afford a house, get that house, right? <laughs> um, but the first point is, I mean, I, I, I'm not necessarily going to take that person, you know, to... to like, I don't think they're coming from the same place as me, but it is that is an important challenge because in the current system we live in, and this is what's been quite frustrating about making the podcast, actually, if a bunch of private landlords do sell up, while I'm not going to shed a tear for them, it doesn't actually really work in favour of private renters. And we saw this during the pandemic. So what happened is rents went down for a while because lots of people were leaving the capital. House prices were very high because lots of people were looking to live in more spacious properties, working from home meant that people were like, oh, I want a garden. Oh, I want to have a, an extra room so I can have an office. So people who had money, people who had capital, lots of them upgraded. So moved into bigger properties. Landlords used that opportunity to sell their properties. Then when everyone came back to the city after lockdown ended, you had more people looking for us or looking among a smaller pool of, of, of private properties to, to rent out. So rents massively went up. You had, I spoke to a woman making the podcast who was asked a thousand pounds just to view a property. She had paid sort of 200 pounds to view properties. And you have, you know, these viewings where you've got 30 people all looking at a house at the same time. So landlords selling up didn't immediately make the lives of private renters better. So he's right. But I do think we've sort of... It, it, it shows how 
terrible the system is, whereby for private renters to have somewhere to live, we need to incentivize landlords to be making a profit month on month and then gain a half a million pound asset at the end of it. It's not a rational way to organize society. But I suppose the, the important point to take from that is, yeah, bashing landlords isn't actually going to get us out of this crisis. What we need to do is build social housing and build much more houses, essentially, and the speculative model of, of housing where what you've got is developers who want to sit on land or where what everyone wants to do is increase the value of this this speculative asset but i do think even despite that it is yeah. important to get through the i think the sort of there's something there's something i call landlord brain what and, and i i get this especially you know people who are in a soft lord relationship where they're renting from their friend you know who's maybe inherited a house or whatever and then that person thinks that they have a right to demand that rent from that person. And I, I think you do need to sort of crush this moral argument that, yeah, of course, if, if they own the property, they should have to pay you to live in it. Because it's like, why should that person work? Why, why should you be taking that person's wages just because you were lucky enough to sit on this speculative asset, right? So I, I do want to get through landlord brain, but it's not actually a solution to the housing crisis. What we need to do is build loads more social housing. And people say, I suppose, just to... Um, sort of preemptive response to what I've said. Lots of people say, well, if, if the landlord sells up, someone else buys that property and moves in. So that's people who leave the rental market. Well, the reason that doesn't quite work here is because owner occupiers tend to occupy more space than renters. So I live in a quite a small flat with three people. If mm -hmm. our landlord decided to sell up, it wouldn't be three people that bought it and then left the, the, the rental market. It would be a you know, relatively wealthy couple. So you'd have two people living here three people going out to look for a new place and then you can see how that pushes up prices.